Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beersmith Podcast number 46. We've got John Palmer, one of my favorite authors on today. Uh, in the news, I just wanted to share that I recently posted an article about the Beersmith Lite mobile app that's coming out for Android and iPhone. Uh, that app hopefully be out within the next month. And so check that out. That's at beersmith.com slash blog. You can find the article that previews that new app. And now, without further ado, let's jump right into this week's episode. Today, my guest is John Palmer, the best-selling author of How to Brew and Brewing Classic Styles. John is also working on a new book we're going to talk about in a minute. And uh, my good friend, John, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. I, I forgot to mention your website, howtobrew.com. Pretty oh, yeah. easy to remember. Um, we're going to dive into hops a little bit today. I know you've been uh, traveling a lot in South America and talking about hops. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering if you could maybe just start us out with some of the basics, maybe talk about hops and, and what alphas and betas are, for example. Oh, sure. Well, um, yeah, I, one thing I've learned in my recent travels is that, um, you know, everybody in, in South America, Mexico, when I'm, I mean, in Argentina and Brazil mm-hmm. and also in Mexico, um, you know, it's same as here in the United States. We love IPAs. We love India Pale Ales with that, you know, that big, aggressive hop aroma and flavor in the beer. Um, and if you don't get fresh ingredients, that can be really tough to achieve. Um, I didn't realize how tough until I went down and, and had a couple of beers that, you know, the hops were well stored, but they were still a couple of years old. Oh, and, wow. and that, you know, that reduces the amount of fresh aroma that you can get from them. So the, and it, it, it kind of, um, it clued me in a little bit on some things that I've uh, wondered about and researched in the last few years on hops. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I'll talk about today the, 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 Aroma, where the aroma comes from, where the uh, the where the alpha and beta acids manifest in the beer, and we can look at the issue of freshness a bit. Um, but going back to your your first question, yeah, you know, what's you know the basics here? What are we talking about with hops? Well, the the bitterness you know traditionally comes um, from you know one hop addition at the beginning of the boil, sixty minutes or so. And that isomerizes the alpha acids um, and puts these isomerized alpha acids into the beer, and that's what makes it bitter. That's what we all know. Um, trouble is, that's not the whole story. So, you, I mean, you mentioned isomerization. Can you just maybe, in layman's terms, lay out what that process looks like? I... Um, isomerization is a it's it's both a process and a a feature or a noun and a verb, as it were. <laughs> um, the, in, in, in chemistry, um, an isomer of a compound is identical chemically, but it has a different structure. Mm-hmm. Um, so in terms of brewing sugars, let's look at glucose. Um, glucose and fructose are both a, um, monosaccharide, uh, it's a simple sugar and, um, they're actually chemically equivalent, glucose and fructose, um, but one tastes sweeter to us. Fructose tastes sweeter. And the reason it tastes sweeter is because it's an isomer of glucose. It has uh, the opposite rotation in its, um, its chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, the atoms are arranged. So what is not a chemical difference becomes a a properties difference um, due to that uh, isomerization or that, that that state of being uh, uh, an isomer of mm-hmm. itself. And that's what gives the bitterness. And, that, and, and, and so in terms of alpha acids, you have this chemical structure that in the influence of the boil from the heat, it isomerizes, changes structure, and becomes water-soluble. And that's where we get that bitterness to come into the beer is when that change in structure uh, causes that compound to become soluble. Mm-hmm. Normal alpha acids are insoluble in water. Beta acids are, are um, soluble. 
Uh, that's where the whole al- alpha, beta, acid um, differentiation came from. Is they were testing these things chemically, they said, "Well, this A group isn't isn't soluble, and this B group is soluble." But it turns out we don't get a lot of bitterness from the betas, right? Right. Although, um, as we'll talk about in a minute more, as you go back in history and in how hops were stored and utilized, um, we had more beta uh, influence than we realized. Hmm. Um, So maybe this is a good point to talk about. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Why don't you talk a little bit about the history here? Talk a little bit about, uh, you know, alpha acids. I I think you, I I was reading one of your presentations where we're first, Discovered in what, the late 1800s? Yeah, um, around 1890, somewhere in there. That's when they determined that uh, hops had alpha and beta acids in them. Um, and it, Ten years later, they determined that alpha and beta acids were not present in beer. At least the same, you know, by testing the same way, mm-hmm. uh, they could not find those compounds with that same test in beer. And that's when they stumbled on the fact that the alpha beta alpha acids had been isomerized to make them soluble. And so what we had was in hops, you had alpha acids. In beer, you had isomerized alpha acids. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that you know that discovery led to the development of tests to you know and analyze beer. I mean, you know, we're talking. Brewing beer for you know a hundred or a thousand years, and they threw the hops in. They knew it made it bitter, but they didn't know how it made it bitter, and they didn't know you know what that mechanism was. So it was really only at, you know the eight, late in eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds that they started chemically um, identifying these things. Mm-hmm. And um, as they developed this test, um, it was fairly fairly accurate, but it took all day. It was um, a, um, a involved lots of chemical separations using solvents, um, decanting back and forth to isolate the compounds. And um, so it was, you know, rather tedious. Um, in that time, they also d- discovered that the beta acids uh, contribute to, to the bitterness in beer. Um, and that they did that by being oxidized. <laughs> so, if you look at beer historically, you have beers that are being brewed, um, hops that are being, you know, picked, dried, and stored, you know, without refrigeration for, you know, months or years at a time before they're used. And so, uh, in essence, what you had was a decrease in the alpha potential of a yeah. hop. And the oxidation of these beta acids, which are bitter. Unoxidized beta acids are not bitter. They don't go in the beer. Mm-hmm. But when you oxidize them you know, by letting the hops sit around, then they go into the beer when you boil. So, in other words, hot bitterness historically was probably a, a greater proportion of oxidized beta acid bitterness than isomerized alpha bitterness. I see. So that's why that's why betas played a much larger role then than they do today, right? And today, you know, at most we get our hops fresh, at least here in the United States. They're stored cold. Um, we're brewing with high alpha varieties, so we're not putting the physical weight and you know mass of hops in the in the beer that we used to. Um, we're putting less hops, higher bitterness, all alpha, and so the bitterness is changing um, in the beers. I mean, what happens if you don't store your hops properly and you use them in your beer? Well, again, you get you you go to um, a reduced alpha uh, component. To these as the alpha acids oxidize, they become uh, unbitter, and uh, you can't you can't unoxidize them to right. put your. Um, meanwhile, the beta acids oxidize, and those become the principal bittering ingredient. Um, you also lose a lot of your hop oils and, you know, a lot of your aroma. Because they're fragile, right? Yeah, those those are very volatile. Um, they gradually off-gas at room temperature. Um, only by keeping them really cold, like in the refrigerator or freezer, do you help retain them. Um, and away from oxygen, right? And away from oxygen because they are also susceptible to oxidation 
uh, change. I won't say damage, because uh, it's interesting that the what we consider to be noble hop aroma, mm-hmm. you know, in in German and Pilsner lagers and so on, and European beers, sure. noble hop aroma comes from the oxidation of these uh, aroma compounds. The they're like linalool and linalool and pull up the list so I can get the names. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I got to try to be a linalool, gir- gironol, yeah, I can't even pronounce them, gironol, limonene, terpenol, um, are some of the fresh hop aromas uh, compounds. These are some of the oils. Uh, they're, they're floral, they're uh, citrusy, they're fruity, um, a lot of different characters. The noble hop aromas originate from the oxides of some of these compounds and also the epoxides of cumuline and carophylline mm-hmm. and fucine. So um, it's interesting that, you know, we have, I know mean, we're kind of working at cross purposes here, you know, a modern brewer is where you get, you get in the freshest hops possible and, you know, a lot of oil in it and you put it in the, bar- in the beer very fresh. And we can't seem to get that noble hop aroma we were looking for, or you know that that same um, that that historical hop aroma. Mm-hmm. And that's part of that is due to the oxidation of the hops and the way they used to be stored. Well, so, John, uh, uh, just continuing on the historical theme, can you talk a little bit about how our sort of understanding evolved throughout the 20th century? Because it's changed quite a bit too. Yeah. Um, well, as we developed uh, tests to test bitterness. Um, the the test, uh, like I said, the original test was an intensive chemical uh, effort. Took all day, a couple of, couple of guys in lab coats, you know, titrating back and forth and, and distilling to get uh, an answer to how bitter is the beer. So they started working on other tests. And in the 1950s, um, late 40s and early 50s, they developed another test that was similar to the um, the uh, spectrophotometric test for beer color, mm-hmm. uh, which were also which was also being you know gauged at the time. And this was a much simpler test where you did a solvent extraction of compounds that were very similar to iso alpha acid. Um, did, you know, so it was a single solvent extraction of your sample, and then you'd shine a light through that sample and measure the, the density or the light-blocking characteristic of that extraction. Mm-hmm. And, so it was, and so you were able to get a, uh, a range of uh, response from different beer samples by how much light they scattered of a particular wavelength going through that sample, very similar to the beer color tests. And so, I mean, that's isn't that how we measure uh, bitterness today? It is. That's yeah. how we measure scientifically, right? Yeah. Um, if you look at IBUs on a bottle of beer, if, you know, if the, the if the brewery says this has you know fifty IBUs or so mm-hmm. on, um, and they've had it measured, well, that's how it that's how it's measured. That's the standard uh, ASBC test method. And also, it's the same method used in the in the Euro, European Brewing Congress, the EBC methods. But if a home brewer wanted to do that, you'd have to get it sent off to a lab somewhere, probably, right? Right. And it, but it's you know it's an easy test to do. Like I say, it's a simple solvent extraction, trying to light through it and get your number. Now, I can't remember. Is it white? I think White Labs has has one you can take at home. Do it. Yeah. You know, run it at home, or or you you send the sample in, and they'll they'll run it for you. Uh, the other thing that kind of I think confuses a lot of brew, home brewers today is that we also have um, HPLC tests available, mm-hmm. these high liquid chromatography, where you can directly measure the uh, percent, the amount of isomerized alpha acid in a beer sample, and this has led to confusion. I think in terms of what is an IBU, uh, people at least. I was one that assumed that an IBU was one milligram per liter or one ppm of isomerized alpha acid in a sample. That was your that was the, the basis for the measurement, right? And it's it's 
it's this solvent extraction of bitter stuff, the stuff that that chemically is similar to iso alpha acid, mm-hmm. light shown through it, and so the actual IBU number is fifty times the amount of light scatter wow. from that. So it, it's actually they did a lot of they did a lot of side by side testing in the nineteen fifties to develop you know what's the range of beer out there. Um, let's and let's come up with a fudge factor to get a useful you know uh, scale. And they, I think, mathematically it worked out to fifty one point two times the the uh, absorption. Uh, and they said, well, fifty is close enough. And so they said fifty times that number is our as our IBU, most beers at the time were in the mid twenties. I think I think you also mentioned in your presentation that you know even if no matter how accurately you measure this IBU number, it's really only a tiny portion of the overall flavor profile story and the, and the overall flavor profile we get from hops, which I think is another piece of understanding that's really evolved even in the last few years. Can you can you talk to that point? Sure. Like I said, the the what 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 you're actually extracting in the IBU test is bitter stuff. It's not isomerized alpha acid only. It's, mm-hmm. it's uh, hop tannins and polyphenols. There's right. oxidized beta acids. Um, all of these things that contribute to bitterness. And there's lots of other compounds too that I'm I'm not familiar with, but it's you know that they and they've identified that at least there are three main ones. The, isomerized alpha, the oxidized beta, and um, hop tannins that all contribute to bitterness. And, um, and so if you, look, if you think about hop storage, you know, historically, beers would have been bit, bittered with more of the second two mm-hmm. because you would be putting, you know, with a, with a 4 or 5% alpha acid hop, like some of the noble hop varieties, you know, 5% was kind of high. Um, for that time, you're putting in, you know, three times as much hop mass into the kettle as you are today with today's high alpha, you know, 15% alpha acid varieties to get the equivalent amount of bitterness mm-hmm. in, in terms of an IBU. Um, and so all that other stuff comes with it, right? Yeah. So, you know, 100 years ago, um, you would have had a low alpha hop, more hops per barrel, and a good portion of that uh, bitterness would have been contributed by the oxidized beta acids versus isomerized alpha. So, little different character. Well, and then, and then I guess the other point uh, that you brought out is is there's there's a lot of other flavors that come into play here. A lot of other hop oils that come into play. They go well beyond alphas and betas, right? Oh well, yeah. So as you add hops later to the boil. You know, you do your flavor additions at 30 minutes, your aroma additions at 15 minutes, which, I mean, that's, as a, from a home brewer's perspective, that's how we kind of treated hop mm-hmm. addition. And, and, but you, you need to recognize, of course, that um, utilization, you know, the, the expression of the hops into the beer is a continuous curve. It's not, it's not discrete points. So if you add it, you know, it, you know, um, 45 minutes, it's going to be different from adding at 40 minutes, different from adding at 35 minutes. In terms of the um, the proportion of oils that are lost, um, aroma that is lost, and bitterness that is gained. Right. In general, as far as isomerization, the, the, the longer you boil it, obviously, the more bitterness you get out of it, right? The, um, yeah, there's, I think maybe this is, a good point to kind of emphasize the difference between utilization and isomerization. Yeah. Um, isomerization is the, you know, the, the chemical change in structure to make it soluble. Um, so um, you boil longer to get a, a greater proportion mm-hmm. of alpha acids soluble in, into the beer. Um, the, and it, it's kind of known um, empirically, that you, the utilization decreases with time. So you get, you get there's an increase from boiling for a very short period of time to a longer time to an hour. 
uh, you get a, a rapid increase in utilization up to about 30%. But as you approach 60 minutes and as you go to 90 minutes, the amount of utilization falls off. You only get like, you know, from 30 to 31 to 32, you're going to 90 minutes. Um, and the reason for that is because chemically, as this isomerization is occurring, you're also getting degradation of the isomerized uh, alpha. And there's also uh, oxidation reduction reactions occurring with beta acids as well. So you, in the work, there's, you know, there's both isomerization and degradation occurring at the same time. And that's one reason in terms of utilization of our hops, you see it kind of leveling off and uh, decreasing, you know, or increasing at a decreasing rate. Right, because there's only so much you can possibly get out of. Yeah. Um, so isomerization is uh, really only dependent on temperature. It's, right. uh, it's a constant. It's a it's a constant rate with temperature. If you can, if you were to pressure cook the beer, um, which I don't recommend, but if you, if you were to pressure cook that <laughs> work, uh, then you would get a lot more isomerization occurring in the and get a lot more utilization. Just like, uh, I mean, just like commercial brewers get uh, much higher utilization than we do in our in our homebrew batches, right? Right, and uh, that's that's a good point you bring up. Um, the reason for that is the higher um, volume to surface area ratio of a larger kettle versus our homebrew kettles, because I, I mean because alpha acids are so insoluble uh, in the in water. Um, they're kind of like an oil. Mm -hmm. They tend to stick to the sides of the pot. I've noticed that. And they stick to they stick <laughs> to the break. And uh, so when you when you're brewing in a home brew size setup, you know you've got a you know ten gallon pot or something. It's a lot of that's a lot of surface area to that for, in terms of the volume of the work, work there that the alpha can stick to. As you go to a you know thirty barrel pot or something like that, you know then. Uh, you have much less surface area right. and a lot more of that right. alpha here. Okay, so let's again switch to the other end of the spectrum, though. So we talked a little bit about hop utilization, and we talked about alpha acids, beta acids. What about these fragile oils that, you know, some of them, I, I understand, can boil off in a few minutes? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about those? Sure. Um, there are literally hundreds of compounds in hops. Um, some of them are very volatile, um, and if... And you can only get them by by doing um, a very late hop addition to or the steep, right? Yeah, or steeping them, um, or even like in the um, you know after you turn the burner off, put them in then when it so it's not really boiling. It's yeah, just I know separate. a lot of commercial brewers are really exploring uh, whirlpool hops now, right? Right, whirlpool hops. Um, again, it, it's they've turned off they've turned off the boil. They throw the hops in, and really the wort is is waiting to be chilled uh, for, to the fermenter. So it's that hot extraction um, that they, you know, get some of these uh, late hop additional, you know, and, and retain a lot of these oils. A hop back is another good way, the homebrew scale, especially to get that, uh, hot, that um, very fresh uh, hop aroma. Mm -hmm. Sierra Nevada does much the same thing. They've got these uh, big hop torpedoes, they call them, that they run the beer through. Yeah, can you, I mean, can you talk for a minute about a hop back? Just, just people who might not be familiar with that term. Sorry, no, it's okay. Uh, uh, a hop back is a uh, is a canister uh, that you pack hops into, whole leaf hops, not pellets, and um, you run the work through that canister uh, before you go to the chiller. So you know the boil is off. You're running the work from the kettle to the chiller, or like to your counterflow chiller. Um, and you take that hot wort and run it through a, a pack bed of, of uh, whole leaf hops. And that way you extract these very volatile uh, aromas and oils from the hop, but you don't give it anywhere to go. It's got to stay in that wort as, you know, as you go to the chiller. And once it goes through the chiller, now you've cooled it off. It's much less ready to volatilize, and you maintain a lot of those aromas into the beer. And then, of course, the other method would be dry hopping, right? And or dry hopping, right? Um, now, you know, it's interesting to note that the 
you you still get different uh, a different character from dry hopping than you do from a hop back, mm-hmm. and it all do these temperature effects. Um, but but dry hopping again is a very good way to get very fresh hop aroma into a beer. Um, typically, you would put them in uh, after most of primary fermentation has occurred. Um, so you're within a couple points of your terminal gravity. Um, the, then you could add your hop uh, pellets to, or, or pellets or uh, cones to the beer and let that sit for anywhere from a couple of days to a week. You don't want to go too long because the longer that they sit in there, the more that you'll tend to extract polyphenols from the from the hops, and um, you'll you'll start to get some negative uh, flavor impact as well as from the as the positive from the aroma. You know, one thing I've learned in the last year or two is that uh, you know, sort of our definition of late hop additions has also changed. I mean, it used to be you know twenty minutes, fifteen minutes is a late hop addition and. I think based on the science we have now, that's not really true anymore. Can you talk yeah. to, talk to that for a minute? Well, you're you're doing it, you know, closer and closer. Um, I mean, as you say, a lot of a lot of beers these days, especially very hoppy beers, uh, will be done will be brewed with all late hop additions. So all of the hops being added to the kettle um, in the last fifteen minutes. Um, you know, even and so no no hop additions being made up front. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of the all of the isomerization is occurring in that short span, um, and so you get a you get a, a much different hop character, much more arom- aromatic and, and uh, flavorful hop character from late hop additions like that. Um, as we were saying, that a lot of commercial brewers are um, adding a high proportion of their aroma and flavor hops to the whirlpool, so. Uh, again, not the boiling and summarization steps, like if we were to add them at 30 minutes or 15 minutes in the boil left mm-hmm. in the but in the whirlpool. So less isomerization, but more retention of the waxes and oils that, that uh, we associate with, you know, hops when we smell them in our hands. But for example, I mean, if you open some of the older books, you know, they're adding hops at 60 minutes and then they're adding hops at 30 minutes and they're adding hops at 20 minutes. But right. you know, those 30 minute, 20 minute additions, I mean, other than just adding alpha acid, aren't adding a lot, really. No, of aroma we're, is what we're finding out now, right? Okay. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it really reflects a change in what, what we're looking for in terms of the flavor of our beers. You know, the flavor of beer is evolving, um, probably evolved greatly in, even in the last 20 years. As you say, you know, we've gone from 60 minutes and 30 and 15 on a, on a uh, homebrew to a lot of just late additions. And I think all the, all the additions made in less than half an hour before the end of the boil. I think some of that reflects science, too, is we're, you know, we're, we're really starting to understand these processes and these volatiles and all these other things. And, of course, we got much better ingredients than we had just a couple of years ago, too. Right. Again, hop freshness has improved. I mean, when I first started brewing, uh, the hops were stored on the shelf at the store. Yeah. And you'd walk in, and they're all sitting there on the shelf. You know, that's not true anymore, uh, at least most stores. Yeah. Um. Well, another another myth I want to, or another thing I want to, I want to talk about is high alpha hops. Uh, can you talk a little about the history of how those evolved, and then uh, and then what they're used for? Okay. Well. Um, uh, high alpha, we're talking about um, I, I, the alpha acid content of a hop being greater than 10%, mm-hmm. typically 12, 15, 18% in a lot of high alpha varieties today. Um, historically, and I mean, you know, 20 to 50 years ago, a high alpha variety, um, then it would have been around 10 to 12 was considered kind of a coarse hop. Again, you had brewing scientists looking backward to or looking at uh, noble hops as the standard, as the, as the baseline for aroma, where what, what was perceived as a good hop aroma. Mm-hmm. So varieties such as Cascade, Nugget, Galena, um, Brewer's Gold, Bullion, um, 
some higher alpha varieties for the time, their their aromas were perceived as coarse or right. or not optimal. Um, of course, with the introduction of Cascade, um, there grew to be an appreciation for a difference, you know, a difference in hop aroma, a citrusy hop aroma versus a noble hop aroma. Which has really driven driven a lot of the American styles of beer now, right? Of course, yeah, yeah. American pale ale is is built on Cascade. Mm -hmm. It was kind of interesting as an aside. When I was in South America, um, I was helping to judge American pale ales. And we had an American pale ale that had Amarillo and Simcoe in it. And... um, you know, to my taste, it was a very good American pale ale. Um, you know, IBUs around 40, mm-hmm. good aroma. You know, I mean, I said, I told them, tell everybody, this is a very good American pale ale. Uh, and they're going, well, I don't get any, I don't get the citrus. I don't get the grapefruit, but it can't be an American. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> it is. Um, in America, we've kind of moved beyond Cascade now. I yeah. mean, in, you know, the hops that we're, we're using both as home brewers and using commercially. Um, we've kind of we're we're interested in the next big thing too. Um, so I said, yeah. I mean, it's these are you in an American pale ale. You should have American hop varieties, you know, as the signature. But understand that American hop varieties has broadened a bit to include you know varieties such as Simcoe and Amarillo, not just Cascade and Centennial. So. Um, which, for those of you who aren't real familiar with those, is Cascade Centennial being the more grapefruity, citrusy, um, you know, em- embodiment of the American hop. Simcoe being a little bit more piney, Amarillo being a little bit more uh, floral uh, and fruity um, than, say, citrus. So, and a lot of a lot of these have been driven, of course, by commercial. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, a- really, what drove the whole I Alpha hop? thing was commercial needs right you can produce more alpha per acre that's right you can produce uh what is it hop extract right that can be used uh commercially right stored for a long time so as so as you know as what we desire in a beer in terms of hop aroma and hop flavor as that has evolved um so too has our acceptance of high alpha varieties beyond bittering used to be you know, commercial beer, they would take a high alpha variety, heat it at 60 minutes. That was that one addition. And, um, you know, and of course, in the course of that 60 minutes, all the aroma and flavor of that hop would really go away. And they were in the aroma and flavor that the hop had was just kind of discounted. Right. Uh, and they, if they wanted to add aroma, they'd add, you know, low alpha hops, right? Well, it, yeah, exactly. A noble hop or an aroma. Or we, hop. Yeah, we call them aroma hops, right? I mean, if you look, most hops are categorized either bitterness or aroma. When now we're finding out, well, there's not really that hard yeah. line between the two. And in fact, your high alpha varieties tend to have more oil, you know, per cone than a low alpha variety. And so you can, in ter- even in terms of dry hopping or the the late hop additions. Um, you're you get more bang for your buck from a high alpha variety uh and adding those in you get more of that oil and that aroma that you're looking for so, i mean that's another thing that's evolved over the last couple of years people are starting to use these high alpha bittering hops for for their aroma because it turns out they have some pretty good aroma they have a lot of these flavor compounds we're looking for if i mean i mean i myself you know as a beer drinker don't love every high alpha variety that comes along um the Columbus and, and um, Zeus Tomahawk varieties are not my favorite in terms of uh, hop aroma in a beer. Sure, you know I like Centennial. I like you know some of the the, the uh, New Zealand hops. You know that are high alpha, but they have a different character. Mm-hmm. But um, same with some of the German varieties, like um, Magnum uh, has a very nice oil and a pleasant aroma. Um, and you can use it later in the brew if, if that's the kind of aroma you like. It's just it, a lot of boils down to personal taste. Absolutely. Um, 
Well, in brewing classic styles, you actually uh, characterize some of the popular hop varieties. I was wondering if, you know, you probably can't go through every one of them, but talk a little bit about, you know, sure. what, what character the different hops have. A lot of people haven't had the chance to, to sample, you know, a wide variety of hops and brew with a wide variety of hops. Maybe if you could just share a little bit of that. The, the in, in brewing classic styles, Jamil and I put together a, a hop circle, you know, a, a graph where we laid out different um, characteristic aromas or mm-hmm. flavor around the circle and tried to place um, different varieties within that, you know, in terms of, you know, were they more of a spicy or evergreen flavor or, or floral and spicy or floral and fruity? Um, you know, what is, how would you define, you know, at first glance, the aroma character of a hop? And so we placed all these hops in there, and it was kind of interesting to realize that you can broadly characterize hops uh, in that way. For instance, a lot of your English varieties, like West Kent Goldings, Progress, Target, um, you know, they they can be broadly characterized as being a, a floral, fruity hop mm-hmm. or a fl- fruity, earthy. Uh, hop character. Does you get and, that those fruity English beers you're making from them, right? Right. <laughs> you want to taste the esters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and hops add, you know, hops contain esters. Yeah, normally I think when we talk about esters in brewing, we're referring to yeast derived. Right. But you get you also get esters from the hops. Sure. So, and that's where a lot of these English varieties uh, have uh, contribute a lot. Okay. Very similar to the English varieties are the uh, New Zealand or Pacific varieties, such as uh, Pacific Gem, uh, Nelson Sauvignon. Um, a lot of these um, from New Zealand and Australia um, have a very fruity character, a very, very fruity citrus, uh, passion fruit, mango. And you can, um, even though... Um, Varieties such as Amarillo and Citra aren't grown in the Pacific, um, you know, don't come from that region. Mm-hmm. They have similar characters themselves, where in Citra you get a very strong mango uh, character, very much the, this new world or this new um, um, type of, of aroma hop that people are using in, in a lot of beers today. Um, your German hops you can characterize as spicy floral. Um, and those would be like your Magnum, your Noble hops, Tetnanger, Middle Fru, um, Saws, and so on. Those tend to have a spicy uh, floral character. Mm-hmm. So the that hop, that hop chart graph or chart wasn't intended to be the last word on what hops are similar to other hops. Right. But at least it does give you a ballpark, you know, or, you know, something that, you know, a way of looking at different different uh, varieties of hops and seeing what is, you know, reasonably close. If you can't get one hop, a particular hop for a recipe for your beer, you can choose a hop that is has similar characteristics and try that. So, John, how do you go about taking all this knowledge we talked about today and applying it to, to make a better beer? Well, I think um, I think the take-home lessons are that hop storage is critical. Um, if you are, you know, going to a homebrew shop and buying, you know, one ounce or two ounces of hops at a time, mm-hmm. and you're probably getting those in a little baggie, you know, that's, you know, they're probably being poured out of a jug into a little baggie. You bring them up and you take it home. You better brew with those the, that day or the next day <laughs> um, because that baggie is not going to offer much oxidation protection. Um, or, if if you, you, or if you go and the hops are sitting on the shelf instead of in a fridge. That's right. a clue. <laughs> yeah, hopefully the hops, you know, are stored in a refrigerator or in a freezer at the brew shop. Um, hopefully they're stored in some kind of oxygen barrier container. Right. I mean, the right package is those, those little foil pouches, right? Is what you're looking for. For oxygen barrier. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. You cut out there. What did you say? The Mylar packages, um, aluminized, 
are very good for oxygen barrier, um, as well as um, like heavy polyethylene jugs. You know, you get good barrier oxygen protection that way, uh, providing that they're full and, you know, cold, kept cold. Um, I think, you know, oxidation is one issue, and uh, but oxidation reactions are controlled by temperature. Mm-hmm. So keeping the hops as cool as possible um, for long-term storage is key. I've got, I buy hops in bulk from um, sources online, sure. like Hops Direct and, you know, various others. And I'll buy a pound at a time, you know, they'll last me, you know, at least a year. And I've got, um, I take those and I'll put them in the vacuum, you know, food saver bags, good oxygen barrier plastic bags, evacuate the air and put them in the freezer. And I've had hops stay fresh in terms of the aroma for a couple of years at a time that way. Um, they can be a couple of years old, but still smell as fresh as ever. So, uh, so John, uh, have you got any other thoughts on hops or, or brewing with hops? How, you know, how do you select your varieties? How do you, how do you put it all together in a recipe? Oh, well, um, I, you know, I think it depends on the, the taste that you're looking for in a beer. Um, if you're looking for a a soft hop presence, then look you know look to a more of a late hop addition. Uh, the people characterize the the amount of bitterness you get um, from late hop additions as being a softer bitterness character than you know um, all early additions. Sure. You know, Ninety minute. Um, the otherwise, you know, I would take every opportunity you get to, you know, to smell hops, whether it's in the brew shop, um, you know, or, you know, simply, I mean, you know, if you're curious, buy an ounce of each variety that he has and then smell them all, you know, <laughs> don't use her and open them all up and, yeah. you know, get that. <laughs> You know, buy, buy an ounce of, or, you know, half ounce of each and, and then learn the aromas. Um, so, but uh, I, th- I think that's probably that's that you take. Key. Freshness is very important. If mm-hmm. you want, you're going to get the best transference of aroma and clean bitterness to the beer. Um, and aged hop bitterness, in my, in my opinion, is a little coarser bitterness right um because you've got more tannin in there because you're having to add more physical mass of hops to the beer to make up for the la- lack of alpha the degradation there, in fact there's a if you if you let it go really long don't you get like a skunky flavor that uh well you get yeah um it's it's interesting there's one one very prominent uh character is a very cheesy yeah uh, aroma that you get from from oxidized hops so if you if you take your hops off the shelf or you're ready to brew with them and you smell them instead of smelling you know floral herbal pine you know kind of fresh hop aromas you smell cheese <laughs> like, That's cool. yeah. brew it. and there are, there are a couple exceptions though right there's a couple Belgian styles that you actually use old stinky hops to brew right actually what you do for Belgian is you let the cheesiness go away you you age you age you that. age right through that age right through that and so now they don't smell cheesy anymore what you, you're really only left with beta acids and so you're bittering with beta acids and a small quantity at that um and that's how they get that's how they brew a lot of the, the belgian styles with aged tops like the lambics and, and so on where you're not looking for a any kind of fresh hop aroma or character you're looking for just a background bitterness and that's where you get us from an aged top all of those aromas then cheese aromas have gone away. Well, John, I just want to spend a minute or two at the end here to talk about your new book uh, that you're, that you're working on. Yeah. We're uh, my friend, uh, Colin Kaminsky and I are working on a new book for brewers publications. Um, it's part of their uh, brewmaster series. Um, I think that's what they call it. Yeah, it's part uh, of, you're doing one on each uh, major category, right? So there's one on uh, uh, the yeast book came out first, obviously. Yeah, Chris White and Jamil Zanishev did the yeast book. 
Um, next, Dan Hieronymus is coming out with a Hops book. And then after that, uh, so probably sometime in spring 2013, uh, the Water book will come out by Colin and I. And in it, we're, we're, we're looking at every use of water in the brewery, um, from accepting source water in the door um, to wastewater disposal going out the door. Wow. It's not, it's not just uh, water as homebrewers worry about it, where we're getting rid of the chlorine, we're adding some salts for flavor and mm-hmm. adjusting pH and so on. Um, it's, it's, you know, both sides of that use. And we're trying to make it a, a book that every level of brewer can use, whether he's a home brewer or a professional brewer brewing on a, you know, a five gallon system or on a 50 barrel system. We hope to have, you know, chapters in the book that are applicable to everyone. So again, that's Brewer Publications will be out in the spring, right? It's called Water, a Comprehensive Guide for Brewers. Looking forward to that. Thanks. Hopefully it'll be really good. Well, thank you, John. I really appreciate you being on the show. Well, I really appreciate being here, Brad, and uh, hopefully we can do this again on many of the topics. Always nice to have you here. Thanks. And uh, uh, again, my guest today was John Palmer, the best-selling author of How to Brew and Brewing Classic Styles. Uh, in fact, I think How to Brew is the number one uh, home brewing book on the planet. Uh, jo- John's website is at howtobrew.com. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to John Palmer for appearing on the show. A reminder to you, if you haven't signed up for our email list, you can sign up at uh, beersmith.com. Just look in the right sidebar there. And you can add your uh, email address to our list, and we'll send you an article on homebrewing every single week. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. (music) 